Hello and welcome to another episode of the Shanita Says Podcast. This week we have Greg O'Shea and Greg is, well, you've got loads of different titles. You're an Olympian, you're now a presenter, you won Love Island. I mean, you've got a big resume there, but um, we're going to talk about your story today and we're also going to do like a little fun section of a male perspective because he's probably sick listening to my own advice and we need a little... I think that, do you know what's so funny? Everyone's asking about like what boys think of these things. So they just want to get inside the male brain. So you're in the driving seat today of all the well, meals in Ireland. I had me on, Sinead, all the way down in Sydney, Sydney yeah. back to Dublin. Um, yeah, I'm delighted to come on. And I'm happy to give a male perspective. Um, girls, you're always kind of chatting away to each other, giving each other advice. And then the men are never getting in. Um, so I'll give my two cents. I'm not sure if it will uh, help anyone, but I'll definitely give my two cents. Yeah, no, it will. We need it. We need a male's voice on this podcast. Um, but first of all, we want to go into like your story. So this podcast is all about life lessons, everything we've learned and, you know, everything that's made us who we are today. And I feel like you've been on your own little journey. You've, you know, you've been to the Olympics, you won Love Island. And, you know, I've heard a few times that like you were in a dark spot a few times and you came out. And um, so basically, you know, where like what's going on now like tell us where you're at now in your life and like let's work into it and I'm just interrupting this podcast to talk about our amazing sponsors BetterHelp who have sponsored the Sinead Says podcast from day one and you all know how much I love therapy and vouch for it all the time it has been completely life-changing for me it has really upped my game and for me it just really helped me with my performance my self-belief you know setting boundaries to be the most successful person that I can be and it's also really helpful for learning positive coping skills and how to set boundaries and it just empowers you to be the best version of yourself so better help is convenient flexible affordable and all online and all you need to do is fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and find a time that suits you so to get 10% off your first month just visit betterhelp.com slash that is betterhelp.com slash Sinead. Yeah, I've had a mad old journey, Sinead. And we've met each other a couple of times in the last few years. And I've definitely developed as a person every time I've bumped into you. It's usually at some wellness event. And um, yeah, looking back, I think it's like three and a half years now since I went on Love Island. I went in in 2019 and that was just like a like a catalyst for everything that's going on in my life and even like it, it just changed my course if I, if I didn't go on Love Island I would 100% be playing rugby until I couldn't walk anymore mm -hmm. and be working in a law firm in Dublin and I just wouldn't know any different I'd be in my bubble and I, I presume I'd be happy but I I'm so thankful that Love Island happened because it showed me like what, what's out there in the world and now I'm presenting I have a fitness app I've met some amazing people I wouldn't be talking to you unless, unless I got on the show things like that but then I was very naive as to the negatives of the show and I was kind of um, blinkered and kind of didn't process it all for a few years and I let it all influx at one stage and that kind of sent me down a really bad path but then again I came out of that and I also think um, I presume we've talked about it a couple of times on your podcast that sometimes you have to go through tra trauma to make you realize who's there for you, what, what you value, where you want to be in life. Like I know you moved to Sydney and you're so much happier there. We were talking about before going on the podcast. So things like that. Sometimes you have to go through something tough to get to the happiness. You know what I mean? Yeah. And do you know what's funny? Like I know, like you were on Love Island. I, do you know why I was on Love Island? No, you weren't. Were you? Yeah. All, all, <laughs> wait, wait, wait. All for 15 seconds and with subtitles. I don't remember that at all. I know, what? but I was, only, I was only there for like 15 seconds. But like even what I suffered, like I have a whole podcast on like the therapy I had to go through after that stint. Isn't that awesome? So this was, see, I'm a bit older than you now, Greg. So um, <laughs> I was 23 at the time. So that must have been 20. What can I can't even remember now. 23, so that's seven years ago. Seven years ago, so, so it, was it was like the one with like Alex Bowen and all those ones. So it was like literally number two, but we just went in. But they were telling us, I was the same. I remember listening to your podcast and that you you didn't know, you didn't know. And then like a therapist rang me and she was like, "Go in," but it was like at the very end as well. Yeah, so, but I wasn't I mean? watching it that year. I got into it the year when Chris and Kim were in it. 
Yeah, no, you wouldn't even have noticed because I was there for like two seconds. So it didn't, (laughs) you know what I mean? Like it was literally like two seconds. It was just like they had to go in, you had to go in and there was like four girls and they had to choose one. And that was it. Do you know what I mean? So I was like, oh, I just had to go in there and get humiliated and then leave. Do you know what I mean? So I was like traumatized, but didn't know it was traumatized until like later on in life. But yeah. it was such the a show is ruthless. Isn't it? It's, it's fucking ruthless. ruthless. Cause they told me I was in at the very start. I did the dry run as well. So I did all that. I know, like the yeah. guinea pig. Yourself and, and Rob Lipset had your little cameos. I Rob know, Lipset me and Rob. Two days as well. Yeah. I know, back in the day. But um, yeah, so I... Them. Yeah, I know how like cutthroat it can be. And then, but then you did the right thing. Cause I actually remember seeing a news article about you at, straight after being like, Greg O'Shea goes back to study in law and back to rugby in Ireland. And like, I think you thought that was, it came across bad. I know you said that people were like trolling and stuff, but I was like, fucking go on. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I appreciate that, Sinead. I think uh, the English and the British absolutely hated me for doing that. Like, because I basically, Came in from Ireland, was in there for 12 days, won the show. I actually won the 50 grand. I gave half of it to the girl I won with. And then I came straight home to Ireland and started training again and doing my exams. I literally went on like a small holiday. Like, you know, I yeah. just ended up doing the biggest show in Britain. And the thing is, it's not like, oh, look at me. I'm so good at one show. It was like, it was never part of the plan, Sinead. You know, my plan was always train as hard as I could to try and get to the Olympics, get my law exams done, and then follow the career path that I'd written for myself when I was like a teenager. Do you know, when you, you grew up in Ireland, you know, you go to secondary school, you go to university, you get your degree, you get your girlfriend or your boyfriend, you get your little house, you get your dog, you get your job and you do that. That's what you do. Like, and that's fine for some people. And that's what I was doing. And then the Love Island just happened. And I don't know what process you went through, but I went through the process from the start where they got onto me on Instagram. So they either mess you on Instagram or they might scout you walking around like London or Edinburgh or something, or you can apply. I got to one where they messaged you on Instagram. I did all the interviews going back and forth to London, got to the last round and they offered me day one, which is the contract you want. Everyone wants to go in on day one because you have the biggest time in the villa. You get to, people get to know you the most. You get to show your personality the most. And I was like, thanks, but no thanks. I, I don't want it. I can't take it. And they couldn't believe that I was saying no, but I was just like, it's just not not part of my plan, guys. And yeah, this is weird. When... Greg, you did all the interviews. So how did you say no? Because I you know I was like, this is gonna be <laughs> such a funny story. Like, you know, me interviewing for Love Island, because me and all the lads watched it. Me and all like, my mates, my teammates, we'd watch it. So I was gonna be like, lads, I interviewed for this. And just to kind of say that I went through the process, but I never thought I'd get to the point where I'm going into the villa, especially like a day one islander. Um, so I said no, and I was like, oh, that would have been funny, but it's just not part of my plan. I have other things that I want to do, other things that mean more to me. And then it just ended up working out that they brought me in for the very last couple of days when I was going on into my off season, which was actually past the deadline that they told me I could go in. Um, and then I went in and ended up winning the show, um, which was mad. And I actually left halfway through the show and came home for a day and went back in uh, because there was a family bereavement, and uh, which obviously oh, yeah. isn't uh, that isn't very happy thing, but one of my grandparents passed away, which is very sad. So that happened in the middle of it. And it was just a whirlwind of stuff. Yeah. And but then I came home and went straight back into what I was doing and did my law exams after Love Island and and uh, went to the Olympics, thank God, because I would have looked like such an idiot <laughs> if I said all this to the world and it didn't follow through. You know what I mean? Yeah, but you got to the Olympics as well. So I mean that's pretty unreal. So I think it you- was uh, Yeah, it was a good way to kind of close that chapter of my life. Like I'd worked for 10 years to try and play for Ireland and go to the Olympics. And it was, it's just, I can look back on my time now that I put in and all the training and all the effort and all the sacrifices and go, okay, it was worth it. Now I'm an Olympian and you can't buy the Olympic status. Like no one can just become an Olympian without putting in the effort. You can have all the money in the world. You can't just go, I'm going to buy the you know the O-L-Y at the end of my name which means Olympics Uh, so it's just a really nice way to kind of close that chapter and to do with my best mates and all my teammates to to get to the top of sport and we were paid pittance like we were paid below minimum wage so we kind of had a chip on our shoulder to to do that as well it's kind of cool you know yeah but then I think as well with like Olympians or any kind of sport to be fair like 
Yeah, most sports. I know there there's even things here in Sydney and Australia that people that come out of sports have therapy after because they lack purpose and they don't know where to go and they're so used to structure. Um, mm. And I don't know if they have that in Ireland now, probably not, but I know that they have it here that it's like a process after sport to go into therapy because like yeah. it's just so like rigid and routine and everything. And then you came out because you had to retire because, well, you retired, didn't you? Yeah, you retired yeah, quite I, early. I retired at 26 because, and Lowe's was retired after the Olympics um, because basically like you, we got to the top and there's nothing more we could achieve in the sport other than like winning the Olympics and the program is not in a place right now where it could win it. It might do in a couple of years. So we were like, kind of get out while we're on top. None of us wanted to, but it was also because we were being paid below minimum wage and we were all 26, 27 and it's not a great career prospect earning 18 grand a year and like trying to find a girlfriend, trying to get a mortgage, trying to, do you know what I mean? It just, it doesn't work. And you kind of have to realize that. So the fact that we were able to get out without being injured and without being bitter for not being selected or something or being dropped. So it was kind of like, all right, this is makes sense. And we retired, but we didn't want to. And you're, and you touched on it there. It's a major issue for professional sports people and Olympians, the level of depression once they retire, like after the Olympics, it's every four years. And the level of depression in Olympians is crazy. Like in, and a lot of Olympians don't talk about it because we're supposed to be strong and stoic and successful. And we're Olympians. Like we don't get uh, bad feelings. Do you know what I mean? We don't get demotivated or depressed, but we do. And it's crazy. And there's actually a documentary on Amazon. I think Michael Phelps uh, made the documentary because he suffered with depression after the Olympics as well. And he's one of the most recognizable faces in the world when it comes to it. I think he's like 18 gold medals or something. And the documentary is called The Weight of Gold. And he goes around talking to amazing athletes like Lolo Jones and, and different kind of Olympians who all talk about how depressed they got after the Olympics. Because as you said, you have a purpose for four years. Every single day you're waking up and you're going training for this one goal. And if you're lucky enough to get to the Olympics then and actually compete, whether that goes good or bad, you're waking up the following Monday morning and you have no purpose. It's all done. It's great. You might have a gold medal around your neck. You might not, but it's all done. And people then look at you thinking, oh, you're so successful, you're an Olympian. And people forget that the Olympics is an amateur sport. So majority of Olympians don't have any money. They're not getting funded. They're like living off their parents or they might be lucky to have a one brand deal. I know there's one Olympian, he's Irish. I won't name him because he won't want me to do that. But he came in the top couple of people in the Olympics in his event. Like he's one of the best in the world and he's only on 40 grand a year. And he's one of the best athletes in the world. And he lives in Dublin. Like he's, it's just, it's just the way it is. Um, so I obviously had to deal with that. And then you put in the mixture of Love Island, which is the most popular TV show in Britain and me winning it. And then coming, coming home and getting cancelled, but not understanding what being cancelled was. And it was just a mad concoction. And uh, I thought it was tough to deal with it, but it, it just caught me, unfortunately. Um, you got actually cancelled, though, like cancelled, cancelled, like people yeah, were like, fuming. Yeah, really? I, I, I didn't get that at all. I was like, fuck it, well, he's doing what he wants. Like, what, what do you mean? But you, know, you understand this world where yeah. this influence or social media world, I don't know what you refer to yourself as, but like, I've lost 800,000 followers since the show. I was at 1.7 million and I'm at 900 and something thousand, and it's just going down every day. Um, and that I've talked to a couple of other people who've got to help me, like flip my perspective on that and that mm. I'm concentrating my following to people actually care about what I'm doing which is a nice way to look at it now but for years I was like why are people hating me so much and I just didn't understand it um and I was just because I just got cancelled for not following the Love Island route and mm. being in London and having my top off all the time and going to the red carpet events at in nightclubs and things like that and because I didn't give British people that world they just started dropping off which is totally fair Oh, well, that's what I say yeah. as well. Like, even when people are asking about growing followings and stuff like this, I'm like, do not look at growing your follow and see all these like engagement groups and all these things. Like, they're just, I'm just like, what are you doing? I was like, if you concentrate on like changing the life of the person in front of you, like your job is just to look at that person who's following you, do something to change their life. They're going to tell their friend anyway. So it's not about like these growth strategies and all this. And like, obviously there is techniques and stuff that people use, but I'm just like, if you just concentrate on that, that's all that really, that really matters. If you have five followers and you know, you've got five people there listening to you. So like I do always say that as well. It's a good way 
to look at it with, as a different group. That's such a good mindset. And like you, you're one of the best around. You built your following up to, I'm not sure what you're at, a couple of hundred thousand now. And you're just so raw and so genuine, which I think comes across lovely. And you can actually see that. And that's why you're such an avid following because you're so believable and so genuine and you're not selling fake stuff, which I think is it's really, really respectful. And not that many people are doing it. And that's why you've done so well. Um, but it's obviously tough to have that mindset. But it is, if you think, if you end up having 10,000 followers, if I end up having 10,000 followers, that's 10,000 people that care about what you're doing. Like that's so many people. So many. I know I'm just confer- concerned about these like 15 year old girls from Cardiff that like are annoyed that I'm not kissing Amber anymore. Do you know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> Greg, get over yourself. <laughs> um. So yeah, you came out and then you had all that and then you came to the that time with no purpose and you know what's another thing about this sorry I'm just buttoning in could stop me if I'm chatting too much but even with like people who retire get this mad feeling like as in like older older people and mm-hmm. there's this like I even read all the stuff about you know re- people retiring like the older age like your grandparents like getting depressed because they have no purpose and it made me I was like oh my god so I started giving my granny and granda like wee bits of purpose like I, I can't even eat treacle bread because it literally bloats me like and I tell my granny I need you to make treacle bread I make my granda oh, pick me up from the boss even though I don't need like and he loves it do you know what I mean so like give him wee tiny bits of purpose to people who are in that stage of retirement or stuff like that or just to watch people who are in your industry as well and be like okay where where's the steps that you can go next um, and yeah. but you didn't have anybody to have those steps so you were kind of left in this and, and like you were probably told what to do all the time as well. And I think in Ireland as well, we are actually in school and then we go to uni and then we have this expectation that, as you said before, we follow this plan of getting a job and then getting married and having kids and having a mortgage. But like they forget to tell you that, yeah, you're going to get fired from your job. You're going to break up with like 10 people in the midst of this. And they don't give you any tools to even deal with heartbreak. And the worst one is like, you know, I always say this as well to people, in the education education system I'm like do we have any do you know how do you know the steps of grief on how to get past grief and you know all these process and everyone's like no and I'm like it's the only inevitable thing in life is death and we are not taught how to have Mm -hmm. the steps to deal with it and it's the same with with you retirement with heartbreak all these things and with no tools to deal with this so like what how did you get from where you were? Because I know you were in a dark place and then you came out, but what were your tools then to go through this and help people? You know, you can help people with these tools. Yeah, I completely agree with you, Sinead, that like heartbreak is probably the worst thing to go through as yeah, a person. It's worst. Honestly. Oh my God, I've been through a lot in my life, but heartbreak is the worst. Like no one tells you how to deal with it. You just have to figure it out. And even grief, I suppose it's a kind of the same thing. It's kind of like a close... A cousin of heartbreak it's all coming from the same emotion and it's just why don't they teach us how to deal with it like it's just so bad it's it's horrific but thank god there's people like you out there trying to get the message out there how to deal with it um but after i retired yeah i was very lost really lost and the thing is rugby tried their best so there's kind of a think a rugby union called rpi that tried their best to help retire players and they have a retired players fund and things like that and they try and put people into work experience but the thing was I was trying to follow a career path that RPI had no idea how to deal with like I'm trying to be a presenter a social media person and I was trying to get back into a world that I turned my back on two years ago right so I was trying to make that happen and so like a couple of other guys that retired at the same time as me like some went into finance some went into being a physio some went into being like nine to five jobs like they had something set ready to go so they didn't really suffer with what what I was suffering and because I it sounds really really bad but it's honest in the sense that I'm a man who came from a sporting background that we're supposed to be tough and society has kind of taught us to be tough and stop showing our feelings and you're not allowed to be upset you're an Olympian and then I the Love Island stuff I'm not allowed to show that I'm upset and I'm depressed so I wouldn't speak to any of the lads and we'd meet up for coffees and stuff and they'd all be talking about how good their lives are going, how their careers are going with their girlfriends. And I'm sitting there not knowing where I'm going, what I'm doing, no girlfriend. And, and I'm just so lost. But then I'm also a media personality. So I'm not allowed to be sad. You know what I mean? 
I'm not allowed to go on TV and be upset or I'm not allowed to go on my Instagram social media and be upset, Sinead, because like no one cares if you're having a bad day, Sinead. They're like, well, give us the content we want to see. Do you know what I mean? You're supposed your personality, you're lucky to have this following. Go be be happy. It's like they see us as like not humans. Um, so I've really struggled with that as well. And I was just going around like smiling, but inside I was just losing my mind. And I felt like I had to be in London as well to follow this career path that I wanted to do, which was just so, I don't, I'm looking back at myself now. I'm like, great. Why did you think you had to be in London? Like you don't, don't have to be anywhere. You can go wherever you want in the world. But I was like, I have to be in London. So I moved over um, and I got a beautiful apartment in Southwest London. It was costing me a fortune, a couple of grand a month. And um, I had a relationship there at the time that was just with someone that was completely different people. And then so I'm a small town boy in London, like not knowing where I'm going, what I'm doing. I've no focus, but I feel like I just have to be there. One of the loneliest cities in the world, especially if you're living by yourself in a relationship with someone who were just very different people. But I'm kind of clinging on to that relationship because it's the only kind of secure thing I have in my life. So I'm like, I need this. If that falls apart, I've absolutely nothing. And then obviously that fell apart because I was forcing it way too much. So that was, that's kind of on me in hindsight. It's funny how you kind of get down the line and you're like, yeah, that's probably my fault. It was went way too hard. Into that. <laughs> um, but so that fell apart. I'm in London um, with no career focus. So I'm like, oh, I better meet with agencies and get an agency in London because that's what you have to do. Like, I don't know where I thought you had to do this. So I met with some of the biggest agencies and Every single one of them, I met three, and each one of them said to me that they're like, oh, it's amazing you've achieved your lifelong goal of being an Olympian. That's really cool. And it's and it's awesome that you won Love Island. Like, that's so amazing. It's so rare. But like, what is your plan? Like, who are you now? What are you, what are you doing with yourself? And it just hit me in the face, Nate, because I, I couldn't answer the question. I, I actually was like, I don't know who I am. I thought it was Greg O'Shea, the Olympian and Love Island winner, and that wasn't enough for the world. And I just went back to my beautiful apartment in London that I couldn't afford. And I was just like so lost, but I was like, I have to still be happy. And one day it, then I was just like, I, I have to speak to someone about this. Um, so I went to speak to a really close friend of mine in London who was a girl who I talked because Sinead, I was like, girls just always talk about this stuff. They must be able to, I built up the courage and because I wouldn't go talk to one of the boys, like, oh, no way, I can't be doing that. So I go talk to a girl and she couldn't be there for me in that way. She said it was way too much for her to take on because I think she was going through her own stuff at the time. So then I was just like, absolutely. I don't know if you want me to curse in your podcast, but I was like, fuck this. I am never, ever speaking to someone again. I was like, no, I don't know when I talk to the boys. I just tried to speak to a girl that I was really close to. We're no longer in each other's lives at all anymore. And I was like, I'm just never going to talk to anyone. I just got to deal with this shit myself. And obviously that was a bad decision. And it just spiraled, 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 spiraled to the place where I just... And the thing is, this is I want to I want to reiterate that this was like a year and a half ago now. So I'm out of this place. But like this is the kind of place I got to. And people might be in it right now listening to this where I got to the place in my life where I just didn't want to be here anymore. I was so finished with the world. And I was like, I've had my run. I've had a good life. And it was, it was this sad night. I was like, I'm 27 now. I'm very happy with what I've done in my life. I'm happy to go now. And I've made that decision, which is, which is so sad thinking back now. I just want to get that little boy. Just be like, it's totally fine, man. I have you, but no one was there. And it's partially because I didn't reach out to people in my life. Do you know what I mean? I, was with, I went to that one girl. I should have gone to my family. I should have gone to my closest friends, but I didn't because I wanted to look strong and proud. And I kind of decided that I just didn't want to be here anymore. And it was, it was, it was so messed up. And I remember some mornings I just wouldn't even want my alarm clock to go off because I was just didn't want to get into the world. And I'd be petrified that my alarm clock would go off. Um, and then I kind of made the decision that I was like, I'll give it one ma- one more go of trying to get help. And I went to see an actual medical professional. And thank God I did. It's the biggest decision I ever made. And if you asked me like a year ago, not a year ago, sorry, two years ago, before all this happened, if someone had gone to see a medical professional, if I thought that was strong or weak, and I, I, it's, it makes me feel terrible to say it, but I would have been like, that person's weak. But now looking back, I'm like, that is the strongest decision I've ever made for myself. I was like, I have to go speak to someone. One more, I was giving it one last shot, Sinead, and then I probably would have been a headline after that. I went to speak to the medical professional and they gave me, medication to kind of help me out and 
initially that actually went really poorly because sometimes this medication goes bad before it gets better again so it got worse doubled the medication and I was just like this just isn't going the right way I was like I tried and I kind of but then after a couple of weeks it's the, the the pressure started to lift it's just like a like there was a dark cloud around me it just kind of lifted ever so slightly and I just I was like I could breathe again I was like oh my god and I was just like relaxed and I was like okay Greg you just have to get your shit together man do you know what I mean and I was like you've been so resilient for 10 years trying to get to the Olympics and doing all this stuff and you ha- just use what you've learned for yourself and like put your effort and work ethic and resilience into your next career path. So I literally was like, pulled my socks up and I was like, all right, how do you get anything in this world, Sinead? It's about who you know. And I got out my phone. It was that raw. And I started looking at who what contacts I have. And I was like, he owes me a favor. His mom works in this broadcasting place. She knows this person. I started ringing, texting, emailing. And I sent so many messages, so many emails. And the majority of them like, got either bounce back emails or they didn't respond or got no's. But one or two people started being like, mm, maybe I could give you a chance. And I just lashed onto it. And I was like forced myself into their lives. I was like, give me a shot. And I took such crap jobs for ages. Like I was flying. I got two flights a week for a year. And I that my carbon footprint's horrific. So I, I stopped putting up stories of me being on planes. <laughs> but it was because I had to put in the work to get to where I wanted to get to. And I was doing such crap jobs for shit money. But it it's all about like earning the career path. And it was like, all right, Greg, you, you did your rugby for 10 years, but that's done now. Close that chapter. You have to move on to your next chapter. And I was like, I just got to start at the bottom rung and I got to work my way up again. And starting getting little jobs and people backing me and realizing I could do it and just putting in the work kind of completely got me back into the place where I felt good again and I had a purpose I had a focus but I had to help myself to get there for other people to help me and I had an analogy that I put on my Instagram the other day about um like if you put your life in this metaphor of like say I'm standing at the back of my car Sinead right and I'm drinking a coffee I'm on my phone chatting away laughing with my friends and you walk past and you're running around your busy life doing your thing and I go Sinead, is there any chance to pick that heavy box up and put it into my car while I'm just standing there looking like all nonchalant and stuff? You're like, Greg, obviously not. Like, just I have my own crap going on. Like, who do you think you are? But if I have my coffee on the ground and my phone on the ground and I'm struggling really hard to get this box into the boot of my car and you walk past Sinead, you, the first thing I know you're going to do is run over and help me get that box into the car because you're like, I'm trying to make something happen for myself. I'm trying to get my life together. And that's what I, I needed to realize that even though I'd worked so hard and I achieved so much to this point in my life, it didn't matter. And like the world didn't care to that point. And I just had to start again. It was kind of getting over myself and kind of, it's going to sound really wrong, but kind of like just manning up a little bit to the point where I just had to do it myself and stop expecting things to happen. You, you kind of said it a while ago in that sports people, they have everything done for them you know what I mean the only thing sports people have to do professional sports people is turn up and train but you have to train world-class level like you have to train olympic level which is the hardest part to do that's why everyone doesn't do it because it's so hard to operate at that physical and mental level but everything else is done for you what gear to wear what food to eat where to go how to travel like even sometimes your food is done for you your schedule is done for you you know where you're going to be for every minute of the day and you're shepherded around as a group of players like it's just it's, it's actually lovely every, but, uh, <laughs> but then it's like you get out of that world and you just so many people talk about it. you wake up and you're like okay so like I don't have a schedule to follow I don't know what I'm doing and then um so it's kind of just figuring all that out and just processing all the Love Island stuff that I'd been cancelled for the last two years but I hadn't realized I'd been cancelled because I was so blinkered on what I was focusing on doing my law exams and going to Olympics. And when I stepped back and allowed myself to process that I'd just been cancelled for years and people didn't like me and some people hated me and my family had gotten abused, my friends had gotten abused as well. And I was just like processing all that in one big go. It was just, uh, it was kind of like a, a moment where I was like, okay, that's part of my life is now over and I'm moving on to the next part. And it was just um, a little bit of asking for help and allowing myself to get into that new career, you know? And like, you kind of developed like a growth mindset there in the middle of that, because, you know, when you're like full of negative chats, especially when you're getting turned down for jobs, 
like the mad thing is that when you go into the real life world of like, you know, when you leave uni as well, like you have to apply for a million jobs, like, and that rejection like eats people off sometimes. And I went through a similar thing myself where, you know, I was like, oh my God, I must not be good enough. And you have all these negative loops in your brain. Like I'm not good enough, not smart enough. I can't get the job. I should just stick to what I know, blah, blah, blah. So these things go round and round your head and we don't have the tools to stop and go, okay, hit them in front of us, you know, think tools like meditation or emotional awareness, like these things that we can stop the thoughts and go, okay. And that, cause we're sitting in victim there. Like, I feel like for me, I was in victim. Oh, I can't get a job. I can't get an apartment. I'm running out of money. Instead of going, how can I get more money? How can I get an apartment? How can I apply for more jobs? Like there's this like massive shift. I think it sounds like even like the best thing for you was the medication really lifted you out of that mindset and like threw you into like this growth mindset of like, solution based thinking like there's no option it's like there's a solution to this and that's mm-hmm. something that definitely helped me like I did a thing called the mental diet when I was in that thing it's called um, and literally saved my life I was in a similar spot to you and it was just being there and my job for 10 days was to if I had a negative thought I had to have a 100% solution um so no matter what I did I had to have a solution even if I had one negative thought like for example like negative thoughts of women is our bodies and you know you have two options you accept your body or you do something about it so sitting wallowing and how you feel like it was just choose choose now and I even remember thinking I want to start this events this events company and I had this idea but then I was like oh no I can't I can't do a website I don't have the money for a website negative thought how do I do it okay I'm gonna have to google it I had no choice because like the mental diet, there had to be a solution to every single thought. So I sat and Googled how to make a website, made a website, made an event, you know, haven't worked for anyone else since. So it's like yeah. it's that solution based thinking that like really pulled you out as well. And like the help of medication and it just shows how powerful it is when you're in that negative spiral. Sometimes you can be too low and like you need that help of medication. But it's that point of we could have had the tools and school or whatever to go and deal with this before you got to that point. And that's yeah. kind of where we're going wrong. I think in, in society, it's like, okay, what happens if you get fired? You know what I mean? Like I got fired for doing a shot at work and I was like, I didn't have any money and it was Christmas. And do you know what I mean? Like things like that. And I was like, what do I do? But like you learn these yeah. things and obviously fucking heartbreak. There's nothing worse. There's nothing. <laughs> no, the first oh. one cuts the deepest. And oh then after that, God. it's kind of like, well, I, no. no, the second and third one for me were pretty bad too, man. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll get on to the heartbreak stuff, but I wanted to talk about the rejection thing in yeah. that you mentioned it there. So people would look at me being, being like, oh, Greg, you always just, you're accepted and everyone wants to be your friend. And like, you must have a lot of girls talking to you and stuff, but people need to realize that I've been through so much rejection as well. And I still go through so much rejection. And at that point in my life that I was describing, I, so the relationship I was talking about, that didn't work. So I was getting rejected from that relationship. There was thousands of people on following me every day. So I was getting rejected from the world at large. And also these agencies in London that I was trying to meet with to help me get into the next step of my career were rejecting me and told me, in more words than one, that I was irrelevant and that I missed the boat and that I I, I can't turn my back on, on, on it two years ago and then come back and think I can just have it. So I was just getting rejected left, right and centre. And you kind of touched on it there that that makes you just think such negative thoughts about yourself that you're not good enough. You're not supposed to be here. But the, the, what I didn't realize is that Sinead, we have to live with ourselves. Like we're the only people that are with ourselves for 24 seven. Like you wake up every day and you're with Sinead Hagerty and you got to deal with that person. So why would you be mean to yourself? Like you have, you're with yourself every single day. You talk to yourself, you have your own thoughts. So you have to be your number one supporter. Like you're the only person that's going to pick you up at the end of the day. No one really gives a crap about you like that's not in like a sad sense that's in like everyone's dealing with themselves everyone's their own main character so you have to big yourself up and even though other people are rejecting you look at the 10 people that are accepting you you know what I mean so that is like a a big learning curve that I had to realize as well is that yeah I am getting rejected but I'm forming my community and also I have to take care of myself I come first so stop talking bad about yourself there's enough people out there talking bad about you so let them do that and talk good about yourself so that was also a massive learning curve for me um I don't know if you found that yeah and it's a fucking numbers game like literally you have to knock on so many doors until you get a sale like it's just 
a numbers game it's like it's like dating night do you know what I mean like your friends are like just go on the date or you really don't want to go on these first dates do you whenever you're in the dating game but you have to it's a numbers game you have to try and then even like throughout your life the relationships that you're in they like build this rapport of exactly what you like and exactly what you definitely definitely don't like so Mm -hmm. you have to like do all these things in order to find like the perfect life and the perfect person like I always even think about how many career paths I've been in and like they've all let me down because I went for it tried it like didn't like moved on brought brought the qualities through and it's that's what it is it's just a numbers game and like that rejection is it holds so many people back but it's like first of all becoming aware your relationship with rejection like if it really pains you like take a look at it and be like okay is it really that much of a big deal that this person ghosted me or this pair or this job didn't get it because if you take it on yourself like let's say you go on a date and you, and you like someone right and no you don't you're not really that into them and you just like you ghost them first date I don't know like do like people do that like I probably would on a first day but if you ghost them it's really not that big a deal because it doesn't mean they're not lovable so if you take it on your own self then doesn't mean that they're not lovable just because you're not compatible you know yourself enough to know that person's not compatible does not mean that person's not going to be amazing lovable person for someone else it's just but then sometimes we just take it on don't we we're like oh my god what did I do like was my hair a mess like what do you know what I mean so it's like that that um relationship with it there's a great book the mastery of love and it literally taught me to just go for it with rejection and there's a thing called rejection therapy as well have you ever heard of that no so it's basically like doing things you know that is going to be really scary and hard and you might get rejected and realizing it's not a big deal like tree hugging or something do you know what I mean like go out hug a tree and be like oh it's not really that big a deal like you know someone's going to look at you and you're going to be like a little bit embarrassed but you're like oh it's not the big a deal it's like yeah just go and get rejected for fun like um facing your fears kind of just realize it's actually yeah. not that bad it's gonna happen yeah yeah and you're just like fuck it and then you're just that, like okay keep going yeah and it comes back to that main character kind of analogy that i always live by is everyone is their own main character in their story so even though they might look at you for five seconds and they might laugh they are moving on to do their own story after that and they're going to forget about you so like just do whatever makes you happy and that, I think that also comes with age and, and kind of growing up a little bit and realizing that no one really cares what you're doing as long yeah. as you're not infecting their life and you just kind of have to do your own thing be your own be your own main character in your story but I completely agree with you the relationship stuff is so difficult and uh what I what I've, I've I've been through one massive heartbreak and the other two were kind of tough but one big one like there was this girl that I I was about to propose to. Yeah. <gasps> uh, uh, what? You're was, so young. No, I was 24. I was 24. 24. And, uh, what? That's hectic. Know, I, I was like in Magaluf, like doing shots of jello shot, like fucking hell. <laughs> I know. I know. But you have to remember, like, my, I, the love I've been surrounded by, the love I've seen. So my parents have been together since they were 15. Yeah. And they are like, I know, they are literally inseparable. They're attached by the hip. The only time they're not together is when one of them is in the toilet. Like it's it's so, <laughs> crazy. Uh, but it's lovely. Like and that's what I've seen that love the whole way through. And they get on the, so well. They're like best friends and together years. Like yeah. and then my eldest sister's married to her first love. She met when she was sixteen. She has two kids and my other sister's in a long term relationship. So all I ever saw was these long term relationships. And same with my friends. They're like living with their girlfriend. Some of them are together twelve years and their first girlfriend. They're still together. And I'm like my brain just realized like that must be how you're supposed to love mm. so when I found someone that I thought I was in love with I was like I gotta put a ring on that finger and obviously I forced that girl out of my life because it turns out she was seeing this other guy behind my back for six months which obviously destroyed me at the time like oh because oh, I think I'm about to propose this girl and she's actually with this other guy but um <gasps> it's actually totally, it's to- I actually think it's totally fair enough because she's still with that guy now so okay, I'm, like, All right. okay. I'm like yeah you do you <laughs> um so but like ever since the kind of whole the spot I was in that I described with like my career my relationship my location all that where everything was kind of falling apart um I had no stability in my life and I managed to pull myself out when, and like get back to work where I based my life around kind of three main things which is my family and friends, like your day one huns, who you really care about, who care about you, who you're going to be there for. Um, fitness is my biggest 
lesson I can teach someone if they're struggling. I'm like, well, what are you doing for exercise? That's free medicine that's inside your body. How are you accessing it? And I, I think you just have to be doing something, whether it's going for a walk might be as tough as someone going for a 5K. It depends on your body, but some sort of exercise. And then following the presenting role, I knew that made me so passionate. And I was like, I'm going to do everything I can to be a presenter. And that's what I based my life around. And I've managed to create a life for myself where I'm happy now. And I have things that I'm passionate about. And I have purpose in the morning and I want to get up and I'm getting up earlier every couple of days because I just want to get into work so much. But I have now built myself a life where I'm like, quote unquote, scared to let someone in now because I'm like, I can't. I can't risk, I can't risk. And this is just, obviously I'm still developing and I have to like grow out of this mindset now, but I just can't risk someone coming in and affecting the life I've managed to create for myself because I was in such a bad spot. I pulled myself out of there, I've created a life that I'm so happy and content with. And I just don't want to risk someone coming in, maybe ruining that. So obviously I have another stage to go to get to that stage, you know? Right, let me let, let me just try and analyze that. Okay, so hyper-independence. So you've got hyper-independence. Um, which kind of stems from you're too scared to let anyone in. So that make that makes sense. Like you're very hyper independent, but also it's a very hard place for another person to get into when someone's really, really hyper independent and you have to let them come down and be vulnerable. Um, you sound like you're an avoidant right now, as in like a attachment style. Yeah. No. That's so funny. A girl that I was dating a couple of weeks ago called me an avoidant. And I was like, what does that mean? But it obviously is what you're saying there. Yeah. And about you, like, see the girls you're dating, like, I'm guessing maybe something sometimes always wrong with them. Can't keep them at arm's length. Maybe sometimes you even compare them to an ex to keep them emotionally away. Yeah. I never say it to their face, uh, comparing <laughs> it to an ex. But I might do it, like, internally think it. Yeah. Yeah, or think like, oh, there might be something better, or there might be this, this like avoidant attachment style. But you can you can develop avoidant attachment style when you've been through like a massive heartbreak. Like that's what happened to me. I didn't, I wasn't avoidant until I got cheated on, and then I was like, never again. Yeah. But it comes down to like, a, if you went to a really really dark place because of someone else, you just like close your walls of like being so vulnerable. And yeah, that is amazing. But at the same time, avoidance like never feel that crazy crazy love where like you're looking to someone's eyes and you're like I could die right now if you weren't here I love you so much and we're kind of missing out on that like vulnerability I'm an avoidant too so that's why I'm saying we um yeah. so we miss out on that like vulnerability of like that love but at the same time you you can work you can work on these things as well you have to like let them come in and my therapist always says like lean in like even when you're about to like because you panic don't you when you start getting closer to someone as an avoidant when they start to get a little bit serious, you're like sweating. You're like, fuck. <laughs> I run. Um, when I start, when I've dated a couple of people and when it starts getting serious, I literally 180, Sinead, and I am gone. <laughs> and it's I have, so bad. Are you like that as well? <laughs> yeah, I have every excuse under the sun. I'm like, well, you don't read. You don't meditate. <laughs> like, I'm like, I'm sorry. And like, even with my last relationship, like he, we got together in COVID and I was in therapy for being an avoidant at that time. So every time I was about to run, like the therapist was getting me to lean in. So I was like leaning in, leaning in. So then that's how that worked. You know what I mean? But then also like it did, the thing is when you go into your relationship after having all the tools, you realize that you're not going to be that broken person. So you can let yourself be vulnerable and let allow yourself to love again, like properly, because when you do break up, you've got the tools, you know how to deal with it. You know, you're good enough. You know, you're lovable. Like why your first heartbreak when you're 24, when that happened, you were probably like, oh my God, I'm not good enough. I'm not good looking. I must be shit in bed. Like this is the shit that would go through your uh-huh. head. But like now you don't, now you know better. So like it allows you to like let somebody in. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You're like, even, yeah. you, even you say in the Sinead of letting someone in, I'm like cringing. <laughs> like, um, well, maybe you haven't met the right person. Yeah, I know. I, I look, the thing is, Sinead, I, one of my, my number one goal for life at the moment is having a daughter. So the issue a is that, having a daughter. Stop, Craig. Stop. Girls, yeah, the but, ovaries, I can't cope. The issue is. <laughs> The issue is to get a daughter, I obviously need a wife. Like, do you know what I mean? That's like, that's just how I think it's the right way to do it. So I'm like, fuck, how am I going to get to that stage now? Because I'm just, I just don't, 
it's gonna get it's like a therapy session um what I, happens just, here? <laughs> <laughs> I just don't want to when i fall for someone and it's i think it's it, men are just so intense when we finally let down our barrier our walls and let a girl in to have us have us emotionally we are so invested in in you and we just give you everything we're finally letting you in we're like dropped it we're showing you our emotions we're being really sensitive and we give you our heart essentially and then some of you just stamp on it and we're just and it just teaches us to not be open again because we're like don't risk it anymore like you don't need to risk it like do you know what i mean just create your life and i tell and i tell so many men now i actually met a young lad the other day his dad asked me to speak to him and he was going through heartbreak he's only like 17 and i was like i said to this young fellow i was like listen to me uh, girls will come but i was like you need to focus on creating your life first i was like you need to be stable when your education your career financially socially and once you have your life created i was like the girl is then the cherry on top of the cake i was like do not be basing your life around a girl because if you give her everything she can just crush you and i was like and it probably works both ways but i'm obviously coming from the male perspective here so you know what i mean it probably works both ways but yeah. that's it's from my side so i'm like uh, maybe if we drop the male and female part a bit more go partner i think if you're it's such a scary place to give someone your your heart essentially and i'm just not at the place where i'm ready to give someone it to be crushed again um because i managed to create my life now and it's such a happy place and i know i offer a lot for a relationship so i'm not willing to give someone that until i absolutely know i can trust them to be there but will i ever get to that stage where i can trust someone that much i don't know i know well i'm the same I, well i'm like looking at you going yeah and about the men are worse the men are worse <laughs> like I feel like it's so hard to get a good man in this day and age like I feel like there's not one that hasn't let me down so it's like and you're thinking there's like girls that are, are letting you down so it's like yeah. we're all fucked because it's a new generation and everything's just there's about a million people out there and everyone wants everything as well but um turn rate is just so ridiculous now if you think about it like we're growing up in an age where you can date someone in Timbuktu. Like, do you know what I mean? Because your social know, yeah. media, you set your location. If you're on dating apps to that place, you can fly. There's flights everywhere. It's so easy to travel and meet people now that you can date someone from anywhere. You can be having sex with this person there, like dates there. But if we go back like 10 years ago, 20 years ago to our parents when they were growing up or our older siblings, they grew up in a state, in a, in a, a society where they dated someone down the road or dated someone from school mm. or they never went outside their county to date people and that's why they're all dating people from their hometowns because that's that was their social circle but now our social circle is the world so like if you're not taking every single box you would just get moved on so you were saying there oh guys don't read move on you don't mo you don't meditate move on where i'm like I'm like the exact same. If a girl doesn't hit this, 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 I'm like, all right, you're not the one. Move on. Do you know what I mean? Right, right. Give us your last. Come on. Oh, <laughs> you just asked me a Love Island question. What's your type on paper? <laughs> um, my list. Okay, do you want physically or like? Oh, like give us like a little like preview. Have you got it written down your phone? No, no, I'm just, I'm twiddling my fingers. <laughs> it's really awkward question. Uh, um, I, at this point in my life, I am looking for, um, so do you know, do you ever do like, uh, like affirmations and stuff, Sinead? Yeah, yeah, so well, I'm the meditation queen. You've done some of my meditations. I have. I, actually, I was the first person that made you do a meditation and you had no choice. <laughs> yeah, you were. <laughs> so I was, I really got into that. And like, every time I was like, see 1111 or I'm doing like a, manifestation and I've really bought into it I will always say these about the person I want to find in my life so I want to find a girl that is um like lives a wellness lifestyle she's quite a healthy lifestyle and that, that's like holistic so she's very like into improving herself across the board and she's not just happy to be going out every Friday, Saturday night, going on the piss, like getting a takeaway on a Sunday, smoking, like doing whatever. That's just not my type of person. So automatically that gets rid of so many girls. I mean, <laughs> someone that's living like a wellness lifestyle, which is perfect. And I like, I want someone that's supportive and that's going to be my best mate. And that's like, like one of the lads, but it's my girl. Do you know what I mean? And I can trust her to be there. And I might be going doing a job somewhere that, 
she doesn't understand anything about but she'll send me the message being like how did your job go kind of thing and I haven't really had that before and I just want someone that's really supportive and that's my best mate and I, I always do that for them so I'm definitely looking for that and the third one that I always kind of say is someone that's ambitious so I want a girl that's working towards something and in her own life so that she's quite independent and she doesn't need me to like fund her life do you know what I mean if the relationship broke down she's completely okay to do her own thing so I don't I think some people get like caught in a job where they're just making their set salary there's no there's no, no like progression in the career and they're just happy to be kind of tipping along doing their nine to five or it might be shift work and for me that's not someone I want to be with I want someone that's chasing a, a dream yeah. chasing progression so ambition wellness and supportive is kind of what I'm looking for um, and the come with the wellness side of things, if you're bringing it to the physical, what I'm looking for, wellness, I think just automatically is like a girl that has kind of like a, a fit physique and just like healthy skin, healthy hair. Do you know what I mean? That's the kind of look I'd be attracted towards just naturally. Yeah. Okay, guys, anyone who looks like that or anyone who's got all those characteristics, please enter yourself into the draw. <laughs> <laughs> I'm giving you so much here. Oh my God. I know, but I'm so good at it. I have to get it all out. Okay, right. Okay, uh, right. We've got the last section, which is a meal oh, you haven't told me what you're, You haven't told me what you're looking for, Sinead. Well, do you want me to get my fucking journal out? Because it's literally like I wrote a letter to the universe and we're at it. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> <So> honestly, <laughs> yeah. I feel like I've, no, I am a... Uh, kind of been like a mom for the last few people. Like, you know, like very nurturing and very... um. I do everything, look after everything and, you know, nobody plans anything. You know what I mean? Very, everything is planned by me. I look after them like in every aspect and I'm just ready as well to just like not have this responsibility for someone else and actually have, yeah, just like actually have someone who has growth mindset, like grow, 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 like wants to read, wants to know, like, do you know, like if I go to like a book club or someone listens to a podcast or I'm having a conversation with someone I'm like, this is the kind of conversation I want to have with my partner. I don't want to be asking him, you know, what did your friends do at work? Or, you know, because I feel like when I'm with someone, the conversation is like about our friends. And I'm just like, no, I want to talk about like all the things you want to do in your life and like how we can do this together and how we can like grow and expand and stuff like that. Yeah. And I also always go for younger guys. So I'm trying my best to go to go higher and. Um, but I don't, it's not been fucking working out very well. I somehow seem to attract 25 year olds when I'm like out and about. But I think that's because people that are out and about are 25 and I'm 30. So I don't know. So I even like people look younger and then I'm like, oh, go on a date with them. And then I'm like, oh, and also like because as well, like when you have something like endometriosis or dermatosis, you kind of have like a time ticking bomb as well for having babies. I'm kind of in that space. So I'm like, but telling a guy that on a date. I tell them straight away. Like, I'm not saying anytime soon, but I'm saying like, this is the past. So this isn't your path. When you turn 30, you don't give a fuck. Like, you're just like, whatever. Yeah. You just tell them. And then, out there in the table. Yeah, yeah. And then everyone's just like, bye. No, to be fair. No, they're not like, bye. But you just know by the when, maturity. So mature. 25, 25 isn't, isn't old enough for a lad to have a shit together. Do you know what I mean? That's Absolutely 25. not. No. Oh, I, no, I'm just like, it has to be, it has to be up now. It has to go you know what I mean and like I just need to have myself and then they look after themselves and then we come together and um, you need a man that has his life together that's that has his job has his career has his family like his his, his siblings and then you're just a nice yeah person to have to come into his life and leave again rather than like you coming in and mothering someone that doesn't have their shit together you yeah know what I mean and it's it's hard to come by, but they're they're out there. My sister uh, found one a couple of years ago, and she's so much. She's so happy, and she's yeah. going. Through, she's going through what you're going through right now, and she's so happy. So it does happen. Yeah, my best friend Gemma is all. She she has like the perfect fiance, and she's like, "You're gonna find like an aisle. and I'm like, "No, he's like one of a kind. Like it's ridiculous." But no, we really? have faith. They're right yeah. there. We'll get there, Sinead. We'll get there. Okay, right. <laughs> so this is the last section of a meal perspective. And you're going to give us your meal perspective because there was a lot of upset people on the meal perspective of Valentine's Day. Oh my God. The meal right. perspective. This is a whole. Should you get should you get flowers? Like, do you think it's weird? Do you actually think it's a gimmicky? Do you get really annoyed that you have to buy flowers? Like, would you plan the date? Do you just, like... 
I I I can't speak for every man, right? Okay. But I'll tell you I'll tell you two stories. The one is a little quick one. So Valentine's Day has just gone. I'm not with anyone, so I wasn't buying stuff. But I was in the studio on Virgin Media uh, just before going on the six o'clock show, and we're going through who got what from their partners. And there was two men working in the backroom staff in the studios, and they hadn't got anything for their wives. And I was like, lads, I was like, why haven't you gotten something? I was like, it's such a win-win. I was like, when we leave the show, go to the shop, get any flowers, any card, any chocolates. It doesn't matter. It could be two euro. Just get it and bring it home. Even if she doesn't want it, you've still covered your bases. I was like, it's a win-win. Just get something. It yeah. doesn't have to cost you. It's the thought that you came into her head. Or you, you, she came into your head during the day just get something I think it's always just a safer bet and like a girl would say oh she doesn't want anything and some girls go no nah, we don't celebrate valentine's but every girl or every person wants to be know that they're cared about and thought about and that's yeah. going to show what you're doing it I know it's a day of love where it's probably just commercial and it's for brands uh-huh. to make lots of money but that's fine it's just giving you the day to show your love again just do it you know yes. what I mean? great um, answer I would answer the very yeah. same and I'm a romantic I love it and I'm a big gift giver in terms of like throughout the year like I'll like take your car get it filled up get it washed I'll do like little bits I'll buy you a nice shirt and maybe need some new sunglasses I'm very like that so when Valentine's comes around I'm like I can't wait to see like how much he loves me do you know what I mean so I'm very romantic so I like I like that answer this is how cringy I am right so I'm a prop and my best friend and my has killed me for being this cringy and like I am I'm a gifter I always gift things but so in like one Valentine's for a previous girlfriend, I um, I, we'd actually broken up, but it was Valentine's was like a couple of weeks later, and I was still obsessed with her, and I wanted her to have something because I wanted her to feel special on the day. So I actually flew to where she lived, and I left a package outside her door because she was still upset and she didn't really want to see me. Um, and the package like a mixture of like obviously flowers, chocolate um all that card everything like that but also like she had a pet so I got something for her pet she lives with her best friend I got something for her best friend and I was like I like wrote a note and everything being like this is for your friend this is for your pet this is for you this is for like do you know what I mean and I wrote notes on everything um and so that's how cringy I am obviously didn't get anything in return so that's also top to not not gift anything anymore no keep (laughs) gifting keep gifting keep doing it and plus girls don't get it as much like I would but like it's more a guy for the girls so I think like it's exactly it's a win-win and if you're a fucking romantic you're romantic and the fact you got her a dog something and her friend something no I can't cope I would melt if that happened to me oh my god yeah, it, was, it wasn't a dog it's a, it's a different type of pet but then she had two of them but I also I made a photo book of our memories and stuff and wrote a note on every single photo about what it was and where we were and everything um so that's how cringy I go so I don't recommend lads doing that yeah pull it back that's too much no it's not okay the next thing is a guy's perspective on a girl asking a guy out like what would you think if you got asked out i've been asked out um I'm i've been sure asked you out have. Twice. <laughs> <laughs> i've been asked out twice um and both times i ended up going out with the girl which is so i don't know maybe it, it just ended up but it's been asked out after i've been on dates with them so they've asked me to be okay. their boyfriend and it's and it's oh. worked Oh, yeah okay. I thought maybe like, it was a first move like a first date but all the first day yeah do you know what I will I back confidence in a girl so much because it's so rare for a girl to come up to a guy and literally like I like you do you want to go on a date and it's so okay. I for me it shows confidence and it shows like this girl knows what she wants and it, I, I think it's really attractive and it shows that she's so sure of herself whereas I think a lot of girls are just going to stand there with their G and T in the corner of a bar, expecting guys to come over. And you do this thing where you walk past a guy, pretending you're going to the toilet and you don't see him, but you're only walking past him because you want him to see you. And that you do like the, the look thing, and you're hoping yeah, he looks back. If you That's want him, just go over and ask him, and you're going to find out straight away, and you can move on with your night. You're like to get him where you want, and you move on with your night. Do you know what I mean? I think it's really great. every girl that asks me out, I always will, will say, I'll, if I'm attracted to her, I'll say yes. Okay. So girls, just get asking out. Like, fuck it. Greg says yes. So they're all going to say yes. Fine. If but, you're trying to find your Prince Charming, you're going to have to ask a few frogs on dates. Like, don't I? Yeah, exactly. Numbers game. Said this. 
Okay, splitting bills. No way. <gasps> really? No. Yeah. I have a rule. I have a rule, yeah. right? I pay. I, I'm a big payer, right? But I think the guy should always pay for dinner, especially if he's asking me out. Always pay for dinner, but I always pay for lunch, breakfast, everything at the other side. Okay, you're like dinners for the lads. Dinners for the lads. It's masculine. <laughs> it's like a masculine thing to do, and I feel like. You know, if I paid for dinner, it would take your masculine energy and I don't want to take it, you know. I do. I like that. You're letting the lad be the man. Um, I think bill splitting is so unattractive. I think if, if a lad's splitting bills at you, I think he, he's not the guy for you. If it's early on in the yeah. in the day. So as first day, I the lad's paying. No questions asked. That's it. Even if the girl has asked you on the day, the guy's paying. It's just the right thing to do. And some girls might be like, no, like, do you know what I mean? But I'm like, no, it's just for me, traditionally, a, a guy pays. Um, and then as dating continues, I think that one person should be paying. I think bill splitting just makes my skin yes, crawl. Yes. One person's paying. And I think it's such a flex for a girl to pay for food if like, you know, just to kind of take care of her man. But I'm like, it should be majority the man doing it. I think for me um and you said it there a while ago whoever asked the other person on the date maybe they should pay if a girl's come up with an idea and is bringing her guy on a date they should pay but mo majority of time it should be the guy i think it's just a nice way to treat your girl but then i was on a date with a girl a few weeks ago and she's a big enough name in the uk and we we're chatting away and she and she oh yeah this question came up and she was like the guy always pays no matter what. And I was like, but you have your own money. And she was like, I don't care. He always pays. Maybe on his birthday, I might get him something. But other than that, he always pays. And I was like, oh, my God, you're right delusional about how the universe works. Do like, you know? Um, I think the guy majority pays. But sometimes it's nice to treat your man. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I like that. Good meal perspective. Okay. Because one of them is like meal perspective on meals cheating. Male cheating or Wait, hold like on. Cheating? have you ever cheated be honest no way no i haven't I actually haven't I actually okay haven't. i fall head over heels in love Sinead. like i'm crazy yeah. Like, yeah like so much so my like my female friends and my sisters have given out to me for it they're like you need to relax greg which is a learning curve for me <laughs> maybe i'm processing that at the moment and learning how to not also head over heels i think cheating is the most disrespectful thing you can do in a relationship yeah what do you do why are you with the person if you want to get with other people just be upfront and just say to them that you're not that into it and you can't have everything do you know what i mean yeah you can't have a girl and have other girls you cannot it's just the way the world works it's like if you if you want more than one people maybe you have to go get in a trouble or something do you know what i mean it's just Went to them around here in sydney or <laughs> bali oh yeah like it's quite open no 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 not i know a few people but like in bali yeah polyamorous yeah yeah. Polyamorous, that's what, yeah, that's like a common thing. Go get in one of those relationships if you yeah. want to cheat and be with people, but don't be going around breaking someone's heart. Like, you know, it's just yeah. if you're not going to them and you want to see other people, then you have to be a man about it or be a woman about it and just bring it up and mention it to them. Stop cheating, lads. You're breaking someone's heart. Like, and heartbreak's the worst thing to go through. Yeah. Okay. Last one. Some of them are so funny. They're so thirsty. These thirsty <laughs> bitches, girls. They're like, meal perspective on is Greg single? <laughs> I think we've worked that one. We've already established that. So I already got that for you guys. Um, okay. The last one is ghost. Actually, somebody was like mill no, no that one's that ghosting. Okay, last one. Ghosting. I I have been ghosted badly before, and it's just a knock to the confidence, really, isn't it? I don't I, know if I believe all this, Greg. I feel like where are you getting this out of? Like getting cheated on, getting ghosted. Well, I got cheated on before Love Island by my second girlfriend and she's now with that guy now so fair enough and I got ghosted by a big name she's like a big time model like so it's like ah oh, fair enough um but we've been on dates and stuff and we're seeing each other then I got ghosted and mm. I think she, so what I mean so it's like there's like context to all this did you leave but a did you leave a box at our door by any chance no I left a box <laughs> for that for the girlfriend <laughs> I shouldn't have done that but it's not it's, it's not as do you think it's like it should happen. I feel like if you go on a few dates or maybe like a first date and you go to them, I feel like, do you really owe them anything to be like, hey, just to let you know, you don't really. I think that that gives me the fear to like after the first date, if you don't like them to 
I don't know. But I wouldn't ghost like someone I've been seeing or like dating ever, but just like that initial first date with me. Yeah, I think I, I think from the main perspective, it's a bit of just rip the plaster off. If you're not that into it, just say it straight up. You can do it kindly, though. Be like, oh, it was a really nice day. I enjoy chatting with you, but I just don't think there's a future here. Best of luck with everything. And it's just kind of done then and you're not like wondering and you're not checking their Instagram. It's like, all right, let's move on. It obviously hurts, but yeah. um, I need to get better at that as well. When I'm like trying to stop dating girls, I get very awkward about it because I don't want to hurt their feelings. But so I kind of like gradually just kind of like start Drift. drifting. But that's quite and, normal. Yeah. Is, is that okay from a girl's perspective? Yeah, because you would just sort of get the signs and you'd be like, oh, I'm just reading the energy. But then I suppose she's going to say to you then. I'm reading energy and then you have to have the conversation. So it just mm-hmm. depends. But you know what? A lot of men in relationships do scapegoating. So like what we're chatting about is, is cheating. So scapegoat is like a type because there's so many reasons why people cheat and scapegoating is one of them. So basically they actually don't want to be in the relationship, but they don't have the um balls to sit down and talk with their feelings and emotions and like tell them. And it's also got to do with like people pleasing and keeping people happy. But so they scapegoat. So this is like the hopefully they want to be found out basically. No way. Yeah, no, I've no no feel like that. It's just like because men are not used to talking about their feelings. So yeah. I mean, girls probably do it too, because they don't know their own brains, you know, like they don't know their own like feelings. So if they're not being loved and validated and they're not getting the attention they want, like girls or boys, they will be like, Oh, here's attention from someone else. Like, and they just go towards validation and love that they're not getting in the relationship. So they just go towards it, even though yeah. you know, I think yeah, I, I do. I completely understand that the scapegoat stuff is interesting. I didn't know there was a name for it. Oh um, yeah, <laughs> there's a whole book on uh, all the different types of cheating. Uh, it's called State of Affairs. If anyone wants to read it, I have a book for everything. Yeah, for a good book. I think that the whole ghosting and cheating thing—it all comes under the one umbrella of respect. I just think mm. you need to respect another human being, and they have their own emotions and stuff. So. I think just be, it's always better to just like say it straight up, even though it's going to be so hard to do it and it's cringy and you might be like, oh, I don't know, we might work out. But if you're going to go get with someone else, you have to give the other person the respect and and let them know. And that's also a learning curve for me. I need to get better at that as well, Sinead, because I find it so hard as well. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much for having. Oh, wait, before we go, we need to talk about where, just quickly where you are now, because you've got like new fitness app and you're, presenting you're at virgin media aren't you as well and i've seen you on something else you're on, you're yeah, on loads of things i do i'm a, like a jack of all trades master yeah. of so that's my good kinda, my biggest focus now is the six o'clock show for virgin media so that's live tv every day presenting meeting some amazing people so that's a really cool one and that's where i wanted to be like to have my own show is just mad at 27 years old um so that's really cool and then i the fitness kind of stuff where, so I said, exercise, I think is our own medicine in our body that we can access and people just aren't willing to access it. I think people in Sydney are a little bit better. You get up and you get stuck into the day. Mm. Uh, people in Ireland, I think need to get a little bit better at exercise. And so if you could like bottle the benefits of exercise, you wouldn't be able to stock it on the shelves. Like the mental and physical benefits is just incredible. So I kind of took that. I was like, how am I going to help people get fitter and exercise? So I created an app called Better with Greg. And it is what it says in the tin. It's training with me. So it's all live workouts. Every single workout is with me. So it's a big responsibility because I have to be there. But if I'm asking you to do 10 squats, Sinead, I'm doing 10 squats as well. So it's kind of helping people get through it. And, and uh, <laughs> rather than some people don't want to go to the gym and lift heavy weight. They just want to yeah. do a little bit at home so that's kind of where I'm not even really making any money off it it's more of a passion project because it's cost so much to create an app and then um other than that I'm just kind of chilling and figuring my life out and and loving life in Dublin you know what I mean but hopefully we get to travel a bit more during the summer yeah while we're waiting for here in Sydney all the girls will be sitting there with their welcome to Australia all the girls that yeah. took off the list <laughs> Will you take my list of uh, what I'm looking for and go uh, interview some girls? Down yeah, there, that whole deal. Bring the <laughs> microphone. <laughs> I'll just interview you as well when you come up. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much for having us, uh, having Greg and me talk to you about everything relation. We just talked about everything today, didn't we? So I can't even sum it up in like one sentence. So thanks for listening and make sure you subscribe and bye. <laughs>